Okay, it's it's trying. It's trying. It's trying. Hopefully, we are going live. Oh, there we go. Redirecting to YouTube. We are live. live. Oh, let me just kill the sound. Just make sure. Okay, we're good. Hey guys, how are you doing? Sorry, I'm just drinking my tea. Oh, that's so rude, isn't it? It's like, hey, I'm, let me just put on there while I just drink my tea. Um, hey. well, I got a pizza to you while I'm at it. Whoa, have you? No. Oh, that would have been great. I was like, what, you're hiding pizza from me? Uh, anyway, hey guys, how are you doing? I hope you are all super well and life is good oh hold on this is mm -hmm. oh what have, what have we done isaac what have, what have we done this is this is crazy can, can yeah yeah hold how, on how, go do back we, there. how do we fix this go back here okay um right. there, there you go you, you you can do it anyway um <laughs> and I, I say you can do it just so oh there we go yeah okay mm -hmm. we've, we've got this all right hi janelle hope you are doing well um yes welcome you just missed our yes crazy um introduction that wasn't very professional professional no. all right so we have had a busy week it's been really busy yeah. it's been it's been really busy um we've got lots of things for the show today so we're going to talk um a little bit about some news and just things that are going on um we went to the museum this week yeah which was really cool we went to the uh, museum of contemporary art in downtown San Diego, and we saw an exhibition by Trevor Paglen, and it was awesome. It was, really it was cool. so cool. Yeah. Um, so we're kind of like low key into like conspiracy stuff and like geocaching and <laughs> secret places, and Trevor Paglen is all about that stuff. Yeah, so yeah. it was awesome for us. So we'll we'll talk a little bit about that and some thoughts. It kind of triggered for us. Like I feel we saw so much that I'm still absorbing. Still and processing, just like, whoa, yeah. Whoa. yeah. And I took so many notes. I was like, there's so much I want to sort of research more from this. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we're going to talk niche hunting today. Okay. Um, I'm focusing on trends today and how you spot trends. Because trends are awesome. You know why I like trends? Because if you spot a trend and you make a book or a product or a t-shirt or whatever it is for a, a trend that is about to happen, um, that's where you get ahead of all the crowd. You have something that no one else is selling. Um, and I have a book that's kind of like that at the moment. And it's like, so far, no one has discovered that niche. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yay, let's try and keep it that way. Like, there's maybe about three books that are actual content books in that niche but there's very few, if any, in fact, I think I had the first low content book and I think there's like maybe one or two other people have found the niche, but it's a killer niche. Um, and <laughs> the, the reason you can find things like that is by looking for trends, looking for things that are just starting to happen or about to happen. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, we, what else? We've got um, some news stories. We've got Nerd Corner. We're talking about the iPod Touch today yeah, in Nerd Corner. Cool. Yeah. That's pretty fun. It's Apple um, in general. <clears throat> we had a couple of questions in the group that I wanted to talk about. Ah, oh, the dog just licked my hand. <laughs> honey, hey, honey, come here, come here. There she is. She I don't know. Up. Oh, well, can, can you see her? I don't know. Uh, let's see. Uh, there we go. Yes, her nose. You see her nose. Wow, she loves that. She's yeah. like, yes, here, yes. put my nose up here. Um, there you go, honey. <laughs> This, I swear I'm allergic to this dog. She's making me wheeze <laughs> because no, you know why? Because she's like shedding. And yeah. I'm just, I'm just sneezing and coughing and dying. So um, go over there, you allergen beast. <laughs> 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 we love her really, guys. Yeah. We, we love her really. She's, she's great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so okay, what, what were we talking about? Um, we oh yeah. So we had a, a couple of good questions in the group today, um, or over the last week, I would say. And one of them is about coloring books. A lot of people have been asking how to make coloring books that will yeah. sell. So I'm going to talk about that. We're going to dip into that a little bit further awesome. on in the show. Um, and also, okay, so I, I'll start with a little bit of um, news on our end. Mm -hmm. So last week, I promised you guys that we would put out a YouTube video about Facebook groups. So here is the video. Oh, let me let me um, share it. Yes. Share it. Oh my gosh, I got too many tabs open. <laughs> we're, we're kind of all over the place today. We we were late going on as well. We're just yeah. terrible today. It's all going horribly wrong. Okay, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we have um, a video that I put out on Saturday. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. we, we released this on Saturday. Um, and it is about running a Facebook group or a page on the down low. Ooh. You know, that's the cool way to do things these days. You have to, oh, look, my, my chair's in there and it's kind of ruining the effect of the cool. There we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, everything these days has to sound kind of black hat and sneaky because that's how you get people to watch. Yeah. You're like, yeah. oh, let me show you the really sneaky way to make a cheese sandwich. Whoa, Ooh, don't tell anyone. Check out this amazing life hack. It's like what others don't, what other marketers don't, don't want, want you, you to know, know about cheese sandwiches. <laughs> um, so yeah, I did <laughs> running a Facebook group on the down low. Actually, it's a really, um, so I'll give you a little bit of a, a backstory to this. Um, one thing I've done a lot to test audiences and just to play with ideas is create Facebook pages because Facebook pages are anonymous. And the cool thing is if you have a Facebook page, you can really um, post all kinds of content. You can create videos, you can create uh, pictures, you can post like stories or articles you write, you can repost stuff from elsewhere. And the cool thing is it's anonymous, it's branded to the page. So whatever you post is pretty much part of your brand. And what I thought, and, and the other thing that's really key about Facebook pages is that you can create posts that people will share. Um, you can boost them, you can pay to boost them or to turn them into adverts. And you can hope that people will share them as viral posts. Do you, do you want to like maybe take her? Or <laughs> yes. Because I, I could do it, but I'm like kind yes, of, yes, yes. Um, thank she, you. She's a bit, uh, I know she's like, she's like making panty noises and driving me nuts because I feel like I'm going to sneeze. I think she may want to go outside, in fact. I'm guessing she wants some water. Sorry, guys. It's like dog care 101, dog parenting. Um, <laughs> um, so, yes. Okay. So we were talking about Facebook groups. Um, so the cool thing with Facebook pages is that you can create uh, posts that can go viral. Um, and often these tend to be things that are either very inspiring. And I've got some other videos up. If you scroll way back or just search for Catherine Facebook pages, um, I do have some videos about how to get likes on a Facebook page. Um, but the cool thing with Facebook pages is you can create um, posts. People share things like videos things like images, often things like how to's do really well. Um, videos that teach you how to like make recipes or crafts, funny videos. If something's really funny, people will are likely to share that. People share things that they feel very personally or they connect with. So often people do things like personality tests that are like tailored to a particular niche. Um, and that's what you can use a Facebook page for. So that's something I've done for a while, sort of just testing ideas for different niches. Sometimes I'll create a Facebook page. So I was talking about niches for books mm -hmm. earlier, and I said, well, one of the things to do is look for trends um, and create a book for a trend. You can create Facebook pages for trends. And then the cool thing is you can sort of build the trend. Like you can be part of sort of growing the trend yeah. like i feel like we kind of grew the trend to kdp like we, <laughs> we started talking about kdp sort of a few years Not just ago KDP, and, but just, and just low, low, low content, content books. right i mean kdp was huge i mean it still is huge uh but a, a lot of the the focus was on ebooks and creating you know right. fictional and so all the stuff that was around when we started doing it was really on ebooks primarily and how mm. to write ebooks um, so we kind of got more into the journals and the composition books and everything like that. And now it's kind of a really trending niche in a lot of ways. And it's like you can be part of the signal boost for a niche. You can kind of help grow a trend. So your Facebook page, you can create a Facebook page for a trend, something that you're suddenly getting into that you want people to be more involved with. And you can be part of signal boosting a trend, which is Pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, now, the next level to this is adding a Facebook group. And, mo well, I did a ton of research on whether yeah. you can run a Facebook group without people knowing who you are. And everything I found on the internet said, no, you can't. <laughs> Even Facebook's page said there is no way of doing this. The people, there was like a Q&A and people were like, no, I can't find a way to do this. There is. You can have a Facebook page as an admin for your group, and then you can leave the So group. you figured out a way to hack Facebook. It's not a hack, <laughs> no, and I'll tell you why, because a hack implies that you're doing something that's against 
Facebook's TOS yeah. or against their policy. It doesn't break Facebook's TOS. It doesn't break Facebook's policy. Um, but basically, I mean, the gist of it is that you use the Facebook page to add right, but, but like the, the word hack is oh, yeah, really so, clickbaity and it gets people's attention. Right. So you got so you like, have to label it a secret. hack just to get people oh, no, interested. Oh, no, no, no. You know what it is? It's what Zuckerberg doesn't want you to know. <laughs> there you go. That's you what go. we should have put on yeah, there. I, yeah. So anyway, that, that's the gist of it. And for, for us, I mean, Facebook groups have been just a huge part of our business, yeah. um, of, of what we, we do. Um, and I mean, I don't think, like, I, I really think, I mean, we've used YouTube, we've used a whole bunch mm -hmm. of other platforms like Spreecast, um, like Blab. Oh my gosh, we've been, we've been everywhere. <laughs> I, I mean, I've literally I've been on LinkedIn doing stuff. Yeah. I've, I write Medium posts. But really, Periscope. Fa Remember the oh, good yeah, old days Periscope, of Periscope. We used to Periscope. Yeah. Um, but really, no, it's Facebook that has allowed us to really build our business. And it's been consistent for yeah. the, the past decade. It's been really consistent. So the 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 thing is, a lot of people don't like putting their name on a Facebook group. Like a lot of people are really intimidated by the idea of running a community online. Um, and not actually for bad reasons. I mean, <laughs> like seriously, there are good and bad sides to Pros being to putting yourself out there um so this allows you to try things out which is really nice and i think for me that's like that's how i use it the most because i mean we're kind of associated now we're doing like amazon stuff kdp stuff and things like right. that um and if i start doing like i don't know like um kinky werewolf stories <laughs> it might not like i don't know just because right, sure. it's me people are going to be like oh it's right. catherine right kinky right. werewolf is, is that the right. niche that, um, that you've been exploring? no oh, okay. it's not just, just don't, don't sure. give anything away <laughs> <laughs> although I, I think a kinky werewolf coloring that, book that, maybe work. who knows i wonder if anyone's done that what well, is there a werewolf coloring book that would be pretty cool whoa oh hey. you need a log book for all the full moons because <laughs> that's when the real action oh my gosh a moon tracker that's awesome so you know like when you're gonna shift and go oh <laughs> <laughs> ah, i love it um so yeah i mean facebook groups you can use them to build your personal brand which i guess we did kind of inadvertently like honestly i just started treasure hunting because i wanted some friends yeah i remember, <laughs> like, I remember. That's legitimately we, we were we, we found ourselves both working at home yeah. which had pros but then one of the cons is you, you, you kind of get bored just not seeing other people yeah and i mean we we made lots of friends and like jeff and there was a lot yeah. of people um hi jeff i know he usually pops on and says <laughs> hi but um he'll be like my ears are burning right. um so I, I i don't know facebook groups are cool um but yeah there, there's there's a challenge to putting your name on something and being out there um and i think sort of running it via a page kind of helps with that a couple of other things it kind of keeps competitors off your back so if they're like "Ooh, what's that person doing now like they can't just look at your groups and sort of try and see what you're up to um because you're running it anonymously out of sight, out of they're mind. not going to find you yeah. or, or associate it with you um and also it lets you just test out an idea like you can try a group um for a niche and if it starts growing and getting momentum awesome if it doesn't then oh well you can move on and try something else and i think what i like about it is it gives you an opportunity <clears throat> to really build a brand yes and you can have several brands like when you have your name on it it's like your name becomes your brand and you only have one name so you're kind of stuck with that i know i kind of hate that because <laughs> like well although it, like i i don't know because i feel like sometimes if you're honest about your personal brand mm -hmm. and you don't just make your personal brand about one like i've never wanted to be like ooh we like i'm the book expert right, or i'm right. the bundle expert or whatever um like I, I i try to have a more sort of general personal brand that's more about sort of just creativity and coming up with ideas and marketing um just because like I think I'm so ADD that I, I don't know what yeah, I'm gonna. That's why we went with the tangent brand. Right, I <laughs> think that's life, us. isn't it? Yeah. It's like okay, what are we gonna do next week? Let's right. see. Um, and I mean, it's good to try different things, and I think people are like that. Like I think in some ways it's kind of inauthentic to claim that you just do one thing, maybe unless you do. Oh, there's some people that do. I mean, do, they, they do hammer it down. Do people just do one thing? Yeah, I, I think. Who are I these people? So. <laughs> I don't understand focus. Uh, so, oh, so I wanted to um, 
talk slightly more about the Facebook groups because people were watching that video that we did mm -hmm. about the Facebook groups. And quite a few people said, well, okay, what do you do once you've made the group? How do you build traffic? How do yeah. you actually get people to join your group? Which is a good question. Um, I think for me, the way I started with treasure hunting was that I had a YouTube channel. Um, so I made videos on YouTube and people were finding my videos on YouTube just through the search box. And then I pointed them to the uh, to the Facebook group. So that's how I got started from scratch on Facebook. Um, it kind of came from YouTube and then went to Facebook. Now, the other ways I've built groups, um, first of all, you will get people joining organically. Mm -hmm. So that's the cool thing about having a Facebook group. Um, like some of our groups, we have like 30 to 50 people joining a day which is awesome. Um, and it does go up and down a little bit. Mm -hmm. Some days you'll get a lot of people joining and then maybe you'll have a week where it's like, oh, it's a little quieter. Why? I don't know. Yeah. Um, and it's really just down to whether the Facebook algorithm is suggesting you're grouped people, which is something you don't have a lot of control over. Mm -hmm. I mean, keywords are important. In your Facebook group name, use some keywords so people can find you. Yep. That is important. So you will get people finding you also. Um, like, I don't know, let's say you have your werewolf Facebook group. People will type in werewolf and hopefully they will see your group. But you um, might want to type in maybe like shapeshifters right. or use some other words that are associated with that, uh, that niche. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, put keywords in your group name. Oh, Beverly says oh. she remembers the first time she saw us on YouTube. <laughs> 2015. Oh, my gosh. Like getting wow. laid off from a 30-year career. I'm sorry, wow. Beverly. Yeah. Um, and, yay, I'm glad you're still watching us. I really, really do appreciate that. Thank you, Beverly. Um, so, yeah, so organic traffic's one way. Bringing people from another social media, um, like funnel, like YouTube, Pinterest, like there's no reason if you're posting pins, you can um, refer people to your Facebook group. If you're using Instagram, you could have your Facebook group in your Instagram profile. Um, so there's a lot of ways to sort of filter in people from different ways. Uh, Rebecca says, do keywords work the same way in the description? So you don't end up with titles that are too spammy. Um, you do have a description for a Facebook group. I don't know how much I really like Facebook's algorithm in that way is, I don't know. From um, my understanding, they take everything <laughs> into account. Um, the catchy title, that's because that's the first thing people are going to see. They're going to see your picture and a title. Um, oh, it definitely works for keywords. Right, it's right. Now, the description, so. um, I, I do know like what will Facebook will do is, <clears throat> is market your group to while people are in other groups that are similar. Yes, yeah. So, I mean, I, I would put keywords. I mean, most of our groups, we have keywords in the title. Um, so I would try and put some keywords in there. Um, try and build your organic traffic. Um, so use other places to filter people to your group. Um, so Pinterest, uh, anything, Medium, Quora. I mean, a lot of people underuse Quora. You can go and answer a bunch of questions on Quora and use your Facebook group and your signature. Um, there's a lot of different methods like that. Another huge one, if you happen to have a friend in the same industry who has some followers, like maybe they have an email list, maybe they have a Facebook group, maybe they have a YouTube channel or a blog, do what you can to get a shout out. Yeah. That will help. Um, like some people will give you a shout out if you pay them. Um, even <laughs> And here's a sneaky way to get shout outs if you want to. Um, patron. Often a lot of people have patrons and they put on their patron, if you donate $10 to my channel, I'll give you a shout out. Yep. So if you have find people who are relevant, you can often get a shout out there. Um, how else can you grow your Facebook page or your Facebook group? Um, the other thing I would say, oh, you can run ads. So it's it's kind of a pricey way to do it, but it's kind of like get the momentum going and get yeah. the ball rolling. Um, I mentioned viral posts on your Facebook page. One thing you can do is run ads on your Facebook page to get people coming to the Facebook page. And this is something I've gone into in more detail in our Cultivate course. Um, I think I have some videos on this on YouTube, but if you create a Facebook post, what you can do, if it's really, really good, get a lot of likes on that Facebook post. And then what you can do is for every person that likes your Facebook post, you can invite them to like your page. 
that way they are then pretty much subscribed to your page and then you can start funneling people from the page to your group by saying hey guys did you know that we have an awesome community at such and such um, and you can start getting people to go over there and the key thing is i mean once you have a facebook group yeah it's a lot of work a lot of work <laughs> um i mean i probably spend probably a good two hours a day like answering questions from coming up with content for the group um probably more if i'm honest especially yeah. in the earlier days yeah. um so we do spend a lot of time and you spend a lot of time in the group too <clears throat> so if your group starts taking off you may want to think about getting more admin or moderators on board um, actually make them moderators. Don't make anyone admins now except yourself. There's no need. And I have seen too many disastrous times when <sighs> your Facebook groups, I, I know two um, situations personally um, where people have hijacked Facebook groups and done something bad to them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> In fact, I inherited one group that that had <laughs> happened to um, very kindly from the admin. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, be, be careful. Don't make anyone an admin, just make people moderators. Um, also, post in the group like if if you have ideas if you mm -hmm. have um if you have content if there's something you want to tell people about your niche post and don't just make it salesy Let, let's talk about the the advantages the pros of having a group yeah, yeah yeah there's a lot of pros to it um you i mean you really get to know your audience it's market um, research it's 100 market research more so than with an email or anything else <clears throat> facebook groups are a great platform for really to get to know your audience get to know what it is they're into. Um, so you can use it both to market products, but also to get product ideas, because you're gonna see what the community, what the general vibe is, what the zeitgeist is for that specific community. Um, yeah, and in many ways, we're led very much by our groups. Like if the group are telling us like, hey guys, we need this, or no one's done this yet, we're like, Ooh, hold on. Okay, let's see if yeah. we can hold my beer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, the reason why I love to answer questions in the group, I mean, aside from just providing customer service. I know, it drives me nuts. I'm like, uh, you're a developer. Go right, I should stuff. be that. Right, but, but answering people's questions helps me really understand people's yeah. needs, and then I can start building products that really meets those specific needs, things that I would not be aware of if I wasn't having this much interaction with our customers. It's really true. Yeah, and I, I think it's really nice also for people to get to know you and to like know we're real people and that we'll talk to them. And yeah. um, I, I, I think that works. Um, another thing I was going to say is challenge your audience. That's something that we talk about a lot in Cultivate. Um, like, one, I mean, in our KDP group, a lot of the time we... I, I, I look at it as like niche research. I ask people questions and hopefully we, we get people interacting a lot. And I, I love that connection with people that everyone's contributing to the group yeah so ask a lot of questions get people to join in and to to share with you um but i mean facebook groups are amazing like uh, in a lot of ways um because i i feel nothing gives you really a closer engagement with a large amount of people um and you make friends i mean we've made so many like real friends, yeah. friends we've had dinner with so many awesome yeah. people like people come out to san diego and they're like hey guys can we meet up can we get dinner can we yeah. do something and it's i, I, I don't know it's, I know. it's fun for me like facebook in general <clears throat> like it's all about groups now i don't even really look at my main feed anymore yeah unless i'm tagged in it or something um you know, I glance on it, but my mind goes blank. I immediately go straight to groups. And that's where a lot of my interaction on Facebook now. And that's is. actually something that's by design with Facebook. Mm -hmm. Now they're actually putting more focus on groups. Yes. Uh, and they've been talking about that lately. They've been providing more tools for group admins. Um, and it's just, I, I, for me, it's becoming a really key way to market. Yeah. Oh my gosh, we're halfway through I know, the show. I know. We, we better <laughs> move uh, on and going. talk about right. some other things. Okay, I want to just do a quick niche hunting. Okay. Um, so I'm going to share. Okay, this is kind of our niche hunting platform of the week. Um, and honestly, it's a really obvious one. But I was having fun today and I found some new <laughs> niches, um, one of which I was talking about in our group. Um, and it's Google Trends. I wanted Google to talk about Trends. Google Trends. And you know which niche I found today? Literally just by browsing Google Trends. Spelling Bee. Hey. <laughs> Spelling Bee is the top trending topic right now. Um, and you know why? Why? This is fun. Okay, so the, the current Spelling Bee, the national Spelling Bee, mm -hmm. had eight winners. You know, because the kids that they got to be part of the Spelling Bee were just too clever. 
They <laughs> ran out of words. They they went on for three hours. The final lasted for three hours. They, that was just an endurance competition. Yeah, at and that they point. ran out of words. None of the kids misspelled anything. And they said, okay, fine, you're all winners. So eight kids won the national spelling bee. Sounds like a, an issue with the spelling bee challenge in general. <laughs> well, I, yeah, and I, I, it's funny. It kind of tells you about, you know, that's funny you say that because mm -hmm. it, it, it kind of, it's about static data. Yeah. And in some ways, a spelling bee is based on static data that never changes or rarely changes. So like, what do they do? I mean, do they start... I mean, once you're done with the dictionary, do you start like going to like urban dictionary? <laughs> so, all right, let's see how well you can spell out your slang, right? <laughs> that, that's a de These are like 11 year olds. <laughs> you don't want them on urban dictionary. Um, no, but it made me think, I was like, whoa, this is a great niche. Like how many people have done low content books about spelling? Yeah. I, yeah. Like I really thought about this. You could have a planner that so okay like autumn was in a spelling bee mm -hmm. she got screwed by the way she got really screwed in the spelling bee Why i was ready that? to do my parenting like oh wait what happened oh because she didn't spell percolator right but the 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 lady who was like reading out the words said percolator mm -hmm. but it's got an o in it and she said percolator so everyone and all the kids were like what huh i thought it was a percolator so anyway, she, she got screwed. I'm just saying. I was like, ready. Oh. Um, anyway, apart from personal anecdotes notwithstanding. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the spelling bees, a lot of schools have spelling bees. Like most public schools have a spelling bee. And I did, I looked at Google Trends. It says 100,000 plus searches. And actually, um, Keywords Everywhere showed it at 90,000 searches a month on Google on average. So spelling bees are a really popular topic. If 90,000 people a month are searching for them. So I thought, well, you could have a planner mm -hmm. so that if your kid's going to be in a spelling bee, they can make like a revision planner. So they write down what words they're going to oh, do yeah. each day. And so it has like dates and they can plan out the, their spelling. You can have lists of spelling words with space to copy them down underneath. You could do clever things like have a coloring book with spelling words sort of inserted in the pictures. Right. And there's so many formulas for <clears throat> mnemonics that yes. you can implement. I mean, there's so many gimmicks and tricks and techniques people use to memorize things, you know, uh, you know, you got your memory palace. You oh, got... memory right. palace. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I, and I, I thought about that. Um, so one thing you could do is have just a blank notebook with line pages, but you could add in like tips on spelling. So okay. you could like, I don't know, like the sort of I before E and, right, right. Um, but I'm sure there's actually, I Googled, if you Google spelling tips, there's all kinds of things on like, I, I don't know how German words work or how. Okay. Okay. Like, international. Okay. Yeah. Because, and then also it varies uh, per grade, per age. Yes. So like the tips you're going to give to a kindergarten is going to be very different to like a tip oh, to yeah. like a sixth grader. So you can so, do like kindergarten spelling. Bee right. I mean, like you can cover school. the whole genre from, you know, K to what's it, K1 to K6. So my, my thought is like browse through Google Trends, see what's trending. And it will. And just if you do it with an open mind, I know why Wiz Khalifa is trending. Why is Wiz Khalifa <laughs> trending? <laughs> Wiz, Wiz Khalifa is trending because he smokes an ounce of weed a day. An ounce. That's an insane amount. Wow. <laughs> that's like a 50 wow, like that's... joints, I think, something like that. Wow. I, I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> that's what you do to trend in 2019. Wow. Um, the other thing I wanted to show with uh, Google Trends, and this is pretty cool because I know a lot of people are publishing internationally. Mm -hmm. um, you can actually go and search different countries. Oh, so like cool. if you want to see what's popular in the UK, for example, um, Dun, 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 dun. All the way there it is. Bottom. Okay. Is I know popular? I had to scroll a bit. Um, what is the Eurovision Song Contest? Of course. European elections. Um, Tottenham versus Liverpool with always the football. Um, oh, wait. This switched it out of UK. Here we go. I just clicked on it. Let me go back to the mm -hmm. UK. Whoops. Um, but it's got every country in here. If you want to know what's in Uruguay or Vietnam, you've, you've got it all here. Uh, let me move this. Oh, oh no, what have I done? <laughs> Terribleness. Oh, go away, Catherine. Hold on, there we go. Um, hold on, let me just move mm -hmm. this around. Do you need okay. to share that? <clears throat> no, no, it's it's share. sharing, it's good. Cool. Right. Um, Paul Gascoigne, footballer. Oh dear, he's always up to something. Um, I don't know, there was something else that came up earlier. I think when I did load more. Oh, cricket. So you want to know what's popular in England? Look at that, two million searches for cricket. 
like there's a niche how, wow. who's doing a cricket score book um or a cricket sort of fantasy right, right. cricket like it's it's huge in the uk like two million searches is like nothing to sneeze at and then also cricket is huge in india pakistan um the west indies uh i think australia like a lot of countries uh, everywhere except america basically <laughs> <laughs> don't like the cricket here in I know, the baseball. I, uh, yeah i think so well it's kind of like um simplified baseball you just have like one thing that you run to that's it that, that's it <laughs> I, yeah um, so anyway, you, you can search other countries. So Google Trends has a lot more going for it. There's actually a lot of things you can do with Google Trends. Um, I have other videos up on uh, on YouTube that talk about Google Correlate, which is kind of like a next level of Google oh, yeah. Trends. Yeah. And I love Google Correlate. So if you want to go a bit further into this, um, just Google my name and Correlate. You know, one funny thing about Google <clears throat> Trends that's happening. So I'm I, I, I love Reddit. For entertainment, I go on Reddit and I'm uh, I follow a few gaming, video games, VR uh, subreddits. And what's funny is a lot of people, I guess for lack of a better word, uh, fan boys, mm -hmm. kind of pe people that are like fan over their favorite console or product, uh, they use Google Trends to show the community how popular their oh, game is. Funny. Or like, look, guys, we're like so like in the Oculus Quest, uh, they started using Google Trends and posting pictures of the charts to oh. say how it's comparing with other headsets. Wow. And they're like, look, guys, we're winning. Yeah, so we're getting like more popular. Yes, oh, so they're, they're using Google Trends for data, wow. which I thought was great. You know, Google Trends is awesome. And there's so much you can do with it. You can really search on it and find the history for trends. So you can see um, over time whether the thing you're interested in has gone up or gone down, yeah. whether it's coming or going. or Yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, so yeah, Google Trends and Spelling Bees. Spelling Bees, spelling bees. Right. that's a good one. Okay. Uh, do you um, want to go a little bit further on the museum thing or you think we're... Oh, I do want to go okay, a bit further okay. on that. Should we, should we jump back yeah, to Trevor yeah, Pagan? Yeah, let's okay. do um, Actually, we, I wanted to talk about coloring books. Oh yeah, let's get to that. Okay, let's talk coloring books quickly. Okay. Because um, one of the other questions, so we had two big questions this week. One was about how to grow your Facebook group. Mm -hmm. oh, and the other thing I wanted to say, um, if you really want to like really go deep on Facebook groups, check out my Cultivate course, talk to me about it, because um, I think it will really help you. If you're, if you're serious about building a whole brand, um, Cultivate is really where you need to be. It's like, uh, I think it's about 14 hours of video content, but it guides you through the process of building a brand, building an audience, and just growing what you want to do, figuring out what you want to do and growing it and building it. Um, so do talk to me about that. Message me if you're interested in that, or just check out cultivate.catherine.com. So people keep asking about coloring books, and I guess um, a couple of gurus sort of jumped on the bandwagon of coloring books. This, um, <laughs> hey guys, have you heard about coloring books? <laughs> yeah, I did in 2015. Um, no, but here's the thing though. So the, the questions I get the most are, um, are coloring books still a thing? Do people yeah. still buy coloring books? Um, other questions are, how do you make a coloring book? How do you sell a coloring book? So the first thing I would say, coloring books really started peaking around 2015. That was like when adult coloring books, and we're not talking about like kids coloring books, talking coloring books intended for adults. Yeah. They started going crazy in 2015 when uh, Joanna Basford put out her book. She had The Enchanted Forest, I think, The Secret Garden. Yeah. Um, they're really beautiful books. Um, and everyone started making adult coloring books. It became a huge thing. Now, there's a lot of different kinds of coloring books. Usually what you see in Barnes and Noble or in bookstores are mandala based coloring books. And mandalas are just kind of abstract, beautiful pictures that you color in. Sometimes like the original mandalas are just circles, kind of like a kaleidoscope. Mm -hmm. um, but some, uh, some, some mandalas are kind of more like they take up the whole page yeah. and just abstract patterns became a huge thing. Now, the problem with that is it's really hard to sell online because you don't have a lot of keywords if you're just selling pretty abstract things. Right, right. So the findability becomes difficult. Right. So the key with selling a coloring book on Amazon uh, or anywhere online is to target a niche, to have keywords that will make your book stand out. And here's the thing. It doesn't have to be a traditional idea for a coloring book because if someone loves, let's say, frogs, and there's people who love frogs, they're just going to be looking, and, and let's say they're looking for a gift. Frog. Oh, you got a 
your shirt. That's crazy. That's your yeah. own design. As well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort of. I got to tell you guys something about Isaac. So he goes, um, yeah. Can can you order me um three of my own t-shirts? And I'm like, you already have two of them. Yeah, but they got worn out. So um, Isaac has three t-shirts that he loves that he designed uh for merch. And you asked me to reorder those t-shirts. I love it. Because your old ones got worn out. Well, okay, just to clarify, I have other favorite shirts, <laughs> but those shirts are worn out and I, I got I got to put them away and I have no idea where to get them from. This like, is like the nerdiest thing. No, no, this is it. This is it's not nerdy. It's it's when you have a good shirt, right? <laughs> that and, you designed. Well, no, not that I it's not the fact that I designed it. It's the fact that you you have a I have a lot of shirts that I like, but once they're gone, they're gone. You don't yes. get them again. Like my my one shirt, today I can do anything. <laughs> Right. It was in multiple languages. That was my, one of my favorite shirts. It it had a bunch of holes in it. I had to throw it out. I don't know where to get that shirt anymore. Oh, other I can find you that shirt. Well, right. You got to go do some hunting. So the <laughs> nice thing about, about merch in general with, with Amazon is that you could design your own shirts and you designed them. So you're going to design stuff that you like if, if, if you're really enthusiastic about designing your own stuff. And then it's on Amazon and you can order it, reorder it again anytime you like. That's great. It, it, why is it nerdy? It's, it's awesome. so nerdy. It's like, you know how like Steve Jobs just wears like polo shirts? Right. Like, or you used to just wear black polo shirts. You're like the next level. Is that today's that. debate? Whether it's nerdy to order your own t-shirts? Yeah, it's nerdy. That I would. Um, so, <laughs> let's, let's move on. Um, back to coloring books. Right, coloring books. So the key with coloring books. Okay, we were talking about frogs. And the reason I mentioned frogs is because if you have, let's say your mom loves frogs and she has a collection of like ceramic frogs and frog earrings. And she's just one of those people that loves frogs. The frog people. So when it's her birthday, you're going to type in frog gift. And you don't even know what you're looking for that's where a frog coloring book could be like the perfect gift. So making coloring books for niches is a really cool thing to do. Now, a level above that is making coloring books that are in some way functional. And I've kind of addressed this with t-shirts as well. Our t-shirt revolutionaries yeah. um, course went into making functional t-shirts. Um, but some a functional book, and I'm gonna give you a really good example here, um, is this book, the Anatomy Coloring Book. And this is a book that has, I'm trying to find a, a nice page because there's some wacky stuff in this. Um, it's- I think that one. Yeah, it's, it's like a book of human anatomy that you can color. And the idea is it helps medical students to basically revise for their medical exams. So that's like a functional coloring book. Um, and I think functional coloring books can be used for a lot of things. You can use them for therapy, for maybe like overcoming an addiction. Um, maybe if you're traveling or you're going somewhere, you could have a coloring book to color in your journey as you go, especially for kids. That would be pretty cool. Um, like a field trip coloring book yeah. for a specific place. Um, I also love this book. This is by um, Hervé Toulé. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it right. Mm -hmm. um, but he does some really creative stuff. Like, I really love his books. And he does stuff like this, like white images on a black background. Um, and here's the problem I have is a lot of people come in the group and they go, hey, guys, what's the best kind of coloring book to make? Um, <laughs> what size should I make my coloring book? How do you make book? a coloring book? Um, right. Well, it, it's not so much how do you make them, but it's more people are like, they want to know what the most popular kind of coloring book is. Right. And that's not how you're going to sell your book by copying everyone else, um, because that's how you end up in like the bargain bin basement right. in the mandala section of Barnes and Noble. Right. Chances are, like if you're going to copy someone, chances <clears throat> are there's 10 to 100 other people that have the same idea as you to copy that person. I, like Jordan was a great, I hope, oh, whoa, it's green. Because yeah, it's green. Oh, that oh. sucks. Okay, so um, I have this book by Jordan, who's mm -hmm. in our group. He's been helping a lot of people this week. Yeah. He's awesome. Yeah. Um, and he's done really well with this book. It's actually green, but because we have a green screen, <laughs> um, it's transparent, which is interesting. Um, but it's a Night of the Living Dead book. And what he did, so we we're talking about how do you make coloring books. He actually traced images from the movie and it's a public domain movie. So right. it was okay that he did that. Um, but you can trace images in a lot of ways. You can use light boxes. You can actually trace with the iPad. What you can do is upload your image to the iPad and then trace over it in mm. another layer in your uh, graphics tool that you're using. Um, there's a lot of, and, and what you can do with tracing is you can take photographs of things. Like if mm -hmm. you go somewhere beautiful, you can take a picture of some trees, 
then trace them, turn it into a coloring. But you don't need a lot of art skills. I, to trace. I, I think a light box is it would be. I mean, you can like when I when I went to college, my first graphic design class. Uh, one of the projects we had because be, before they didn't have us touch the computer mm -hmm. until we understand all the basics, the principles of design and stuff. So we had a light box, which is just you know a little box with a uh, kind of a film on top mm -hmm. and there's light underneath it. You put a sheet of paper on it and you can see what's underneath. So we were tracing. Wow, you were old school. It was really old school, but we were tracing magazines. You know they have iPad Pros now. Well, no, no, no. This is this is the thing that you can take mag. We took different magazines and we were tracing things and we were creating collages of different images from different sources. Right. And putting them all together to create something new and interesting. But why didn't you not take a picture of them? And then you can put it on an iPad Pro and then you could draw over it with your stylus. You can, but there, there's something, I don't know, some people prefer the classic of, of, of having like a pen or ink. Uh, okay. The strokes you get are going to be very different than oh, what you get digitally. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so it's like a feel of it. The... Right, right. And if you get in the groove, you can do it really quickly. And then from there, you scan the images and then you do computer post-computer processing. That's pretty cool. So, yeah. So tracing is one option. Um, in our coloring book course, one of the options we did was photo filters, uh, Photoshop filters, mm -hmm. um, and how you can take an ordinary picture and actually filter it to make um, an image with it. People are doing grayscale pictures. Um, there are mandala generators out there, so check the, the, the licensing on them, but you can generate mandalas. I would say don't focus on mandalas as a niche. No. Like use mandalas as a technique, but if you're using mandalas as a technique, your book needs a niche. It needs a purpose. It needs something else going to it. Um, so that's kind of important. Um, uh, so you mentioned functional books. What's the first step? Where do I look to make one? Am I supposed to do my own drawing and write info on it? That's kind of what we're, we're, we're sort of talking about here, how you can make coloring books. Yeah. Like there isn't one. I mean, the first thing, get on K KDP, which is Amazon's publishing platform. Mm -hmm. um, to research a functional book, look for problems that need solving. Like what problems do you know how to solve? If someone, um, like maybe you want to make a book for therapy, maybe you want to make a book to help someone get over a phobia. Um, maybe you want to make a book to help someone track their workout progress um, and sort of like write, write in color about their sort of um, their, their exercise regime. Like there's all kinds of ways to make a functional book. Um, maybe you can make a book that helps a child with a specific problem or issue they're experiencing like bullying um, and you could share that with the schools you could have like the anti-bullying coloring book or an empowering book for kids like first you've got to come up with your niche um, then get on KDP and then to make the images that's kind of what we're talking about we're saying you can trace them you can take photographs and trace them um, you can you can draw them yourself if you have the skills you can take, and I mean, I like when I say like mandalas and using patterns, like I have um, Sasha O'Hara's book here, who is awesome. Um, she kind of took the traditional mandala thing, but then put words into it. So it kind of has the mandala feel to it. Um, but then it also has kind of the, the funny snarky phrases. So like home is where the vodka is. Um, and you can outsource, like you can hire people to make pages for you, to make books for yeah. you. Um, like that's totally an okay thing to do. There's places like Fiverr, there's places like Upwork. And if you want something a little sort of, you want to go a little bit higher or niche check out DeviantArt. There are so many places to find um, artwork. Like go to your local college and see if there's anyone, like you could ask an art teacher or art professor if there's anyone that might want to work with you. Um, like you just I, I have an do idea it. for a, a functional coloring book. Suppose <laughs> you want to teach the history of how the Panama Canal was built. You know, it's something, Whoa, maybe cool. maybe a kid or I a college that. student, awesome. someone wants to know how was this like awesome, you know, uh, creation, you know, what, what was the process to it's make it happen? Educational, educational right? So you can take the, the <clears throat> take an outline of the story and convert it into multiple pictures and then you have a coloring book. That's pretty cool. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways to make a book. Like you don't just get hung up on it and be like, oh, this is too difficult. Like you can hire someone on Fiverr to make pictures for you and then you can edit them there's so many graphics tools that you don't really need any skills um canva is a great one for collaging stuff yeah. together um sketch io is a tool that we used in uh t-shirt revolutionaries mm -hmm. um and we've used that before 
for, yeah. for coloring images and making cool images. Um, you can get really creative. Like you can mix up things like noun project icons to make coloring images. Like it doesn't have to be, it's more about the theme yes. and the niche of the yes. book. Like that's what's most important. And we've seen that over and over again. So when people say a coloring book saturated, I'm like, is your niche saturated? Right, right. It kind of depends what niche you're making the coloring books for. Um, so let's, should we move on? Because yeah, we sure. have, oh my gosh, we've got so many we've other things more. to talk about. Oh yeah, I had, um, oh, where, where is it? Hold on, there we go. Oh, I thought this was kind of fun. Um, let me share. Uh, Tide. There we go. Okay. Um, Tide uh, have reinvented their packaging. But I thought this was really interesting as to why and how they've done this. So they went from these huge bottles. Like, what the heck is that bottle anyway? It's like a massive <laughs> bottle. It's heavy. It's weird shaped. Um, it's plastic. It uses a ton of like right. packaging. And they've made now the Eco Box, which is a little box. And something else that's really interesting is that they have taken out a lot of the water out of the tide. So it's actually much more concentrated. So you only need a small amount of it, mm. um, which I think is pretty much what they do with like Tide Pods. Mm -hmm. um, I also wonder actually if the whole Tide Pod fiasco, whether that led to a <laughs> drop in sales, like kids were eating yeah, Tide Yeah, okay, pods, we right? got to start selling these Tide like, Pods. I, I actually wonder it. if what they did was they put all the Tide into a box it, because people like the more concentrated thing. Mm -hmm. But what was interesting is when you read the why of how they had this ridiculous over the top huge bottle, basically they wanted to stand out on supermarket shelves and dominate as much shelf space as possible. So they watered down the tide with like more water. They, they put more volume in and they put a ton of packaging. They made it bright orange and they made it huge. Now what they're saying is they're selling more tide online so people are starting to buy their oh, washing that makes sense. their washing liquid online. Um, and that means they want small, they don't care, first of all, about the packaging. And Amazon ad addressed this in this article. So this article is actually from Amazon's blog. Um, and Amazon said that basically um, people don't care about packaging. That's why they did frustration free packaging. Because people who are buying online, you don't need the fancy packaging. You just want to know that it's going to work and it's going to do the job. So Amazon started doing frustration-free packaging, which is boring and plain, but makes it much right. easier to use. Um, and this is kind of a, like an evolution towards frustration-free packaging for Tide. But also it makes it cheaper to ship. Um, it's cheaper to produce, to just make a cardboard box yeah. rather than this massive great bottle. And... What I wanted to say from this, um, this is what they said, actually. I've got the quote. Mm -hmm. After all, that orange bottle is designed to stand out on a crowded sh store shelf. Mm -hmm. But in a world where customers increasingly buy products like Tide online, the added packaging used to ship it just means more waste. Not only that, but the size and shelf impression, they call it a shelf impression of the product, um, being sold online is irrelevant. Engineers could remix the detergent formula using less water to make it smaller and more lightweight. That's brilliant. Now, what I think is interesting that we can kind of learn from this is that we're still thinking traditionally yes. about products that they have to be well, they have to have beautiful packaging. They need this and that. And um, I, I think what will sell your product, and this is what we said back when we were doing bundles and started doing bundles, is that it's your thumbnail is really important. The preview picture is really, really important. Um, how you make it look online so i've all like i i think yeah. and i think with books like having an awesome cover having a very simple striking cover um and it's not just a matter of um having like a, a pretty cover it's having something with bold colors mm -hmm. it's having something bright it's having something that you instantly understand what it is um and just things that catch your eye in the thumbnail so I think thumbnail pictures are very, very important, um, more so than packaging. Uh, yeah, and I think also what I would say, uh, you know, a lot of people, especially in our KDP group, you know, they, they want to make these beautiful covers both from front, spine, and back. Mm -hmm. But in reality, 90% of what the customer is going to see is just the front cover. Yes. So the back, you don't really need to put as much emphasis to make the sale. Right. Uh, because most of the users are not going to see the back of the book until they actually have they have it physically in their hand. 
by that point, it probably is not going to matter. It's all about the front cover. So I thought that was interesting. Now, there's one more thing that's interesting about this is that, okay, they converted their packaging into a box, but they have a picture of the traditional packaging oh, on yeah. the box, which means that <laughs> that is almost like a, an icon at this point, a yes. visual indication of- Oh, that's interesting. Right? So, that, yeah. Yeah, so that's really interesting. So they, they didn't ditch it completely. It's almost like uh, they have I guess, to kind of explain to people this. Well, I guess it's the transition period. And I think that's another thing. Yeah. If you change something, make sure you educate your customers and bring them with you on the yes. journey. Like I, I think that's something maybe we can take um, there as well. OK, we've got. Oh, wow. We're mm -hmm. totally overrun. Right. Um, do you want to do Nerd Corner? Uh, yeah, just really quick. It's not. Uh, mm. It's really minor. Um, no, no, no! It's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> corner, yeah okay. Uh, so uh, with, with Apple, uh, they uh, yesterday or Have actually a few days ago. I'll, I'll look for a link while you talk. Uh, they updated their iPod Touch, and this is the first time they've updated it in about four years. So uh, the build is still the same. You know, it kind of looks like an iPhone, like a, a skinny iPhone. Uh, but the internals have all up-to-date processing. Uh, unit. And so what I thought was interesting is that they released this just before uh, their next annual developers conference, which is actually this Monday. And I think one of my hunches, the reason why they updated the iPod Touch was because it's a product that's going to support their upcoming uh, gaming service called uh, Apple Arcade. Whoa. Okay. That, that's interesting. I think I, I think I heard about that. We, didn't we talk about Yeah. That? We talked about this a few uh, episodes ago. And so it's Apple, they're going to have, you know, you pay a monthly fee and you get access to like a hundred top video games and they're going to rotate them. It's really interesting how quietly they've done this. They didn't yes. have a huge like launch for it. They've done it. They Yeah, they're downplaying it. Um, they said with little fanfare via an Apple press release. Yes. So and they, like, they, yep, so. they did this last time with their last event. They updated <laughs> the laptops and just made an announcement on their site, but they didn't make an event out of it. So Monday, there's a big event, and it's rumored that they, it's all going to be software. Um, one of the things they're doing, they're, it's the Bloomberg has an article saying they're going to kill iTunes, mm -hmm. which means iTunes Whoa. is going to be broken up into three applications, music, TV, and podcast. You know, that makes sense, though, because I feel like the iTunes association is still with music, and I've not used iTunes for music in years. I use Pandora, I use it's, Spotify. It's, it's, it's like, right, it's becoming kind of an archaic beast. And it's a huge program. And also, mm -hmm. I think with music, they want to focus on a monthly subscription. But, but podcasts, that's that's where I use iTunes. So the key thing I want to say with Apple is that they tend to be following Google and Amazon and that they seem to be focusing more on services. And so before, their services were meant to support the product. Mm -hmm. Now it looks like the products exist to support the services because all their money is coming from the services. That makes sense. And yeah. that's where it's coming. And it's funny because, you know, Amazon was way ahead of the game when they released their tablet. They said, we make money when you use it, not when you buy it. And we know both like Amazon and Apple are both moving their focus more towards services yes. all the time. It's like it's services, services. So uh, it, it's kind of interesting to see where the business is going. It's that's a little that's nerd pretty cool. Day. I like that. Yeah. Did you hear that LaCroix are losing sales and money? You know, the fizzy drinks of uh, LaCroix. You know how about two, three years ago, we were super excited. Oh, yeah, we were obsessed with that Yeah, we stuff. loved it. We were drinking it all the time. And we don't really drink it now. We've, we've kind of, sometimes we do the San Pellegrino one. Um, but yeah, we stopped. I don't know why, but well, it turns tea. out, <laughs> tea, that's that's right, right. Right. Um, but it turns out we're not the only ones. Every, everyone stopped drinking it. And it's kind of interesting. They, they said, um, really, it was competition that kind of drove them out, that Pepsi and Coke got in on the bandwagon oh. and pretty much killed them. And one thing that I took that I thought was interesting was they said American consumers are increasingly seeking out drinks that have functional elements oh. like nutritional value or a jolt of caffeine um, or they want low sugar and sugar free offerings. And I thought that was really interesting, that word functional again. Because I keep saying in, the, in in our groups, like, think about what problems people have and what you can do to help solve problems. That's where I think, and, and I think that's maybe what they're addressing here. Like, okay, why do people want caffeine in their drinks? Because they're tired, they're stressed, they've got a lot of work to do, they've got a long day ahead of them. When you start thinking about, and I think that's why, like, sports drinks were big and yeah. now they're energy drinks, but... I think, I mean, wine's pretty functional. 
It is. When you think about <laughs> yeah. it, it's like wine. Kind you drink of, with a purpose. It, it solves a problem. You right. know? <laughs> it solves a lot of problems. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so I thought that was right. interesting right. that LaCroix are kind of struggling, um, yeah. which I'm sad about. But you know what? It also says innovate. Like you can't kind of rest on your laurels. It's like uh, the competition comes in, especially when it's like big guys like Coca-Cola. You've got to use your advantage as a little guy. Keep and moving. that's the key thing. Like Keep if moving. you are the little guy, your advantage is your ability to innovate and move. Yeah. Um, and big guys will always be slow to do that. So if you are, and most of the people we talk to and work with are like small businesses and yeah. small companies with just one or a few employees, um, use that to, to be speedy and nimble. Like that's how we've had people like sort of like Sasha and like Jordan um, have managed to take on big guys and like take on big publishing houses like Penguin and Random House. The reason is because they can move fast. They yeah. can market in ways they can't market. They can talk directly to their audience. Um, you have advantages. You have huge advantages if you're a small company, a small business. Um, so I think we're pretty good. I think yeah, we, we, we can we can go back to talking about Trevor Paglin now because yeah, yeah, yeah. that was really fun. Yeah. Okay, so we went to, um, as we said at the beginning of the show, let me bring up the things. Okay, because there's a lot of cool things here. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I want to bring up that picture. Oh, awesome. Um, so let me share this for a moment. Um, dun, 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 dun. There we go. Okay, um, so we went to see this exhibition yesterday. Um, and in fact, there's a picture of us seeing the <laughs> exhibition. You can see us in the reflection. Yes. Well, we like created art out of art. <laughs> and this was one of the exhibits. So the whole exhibition was about this guy called Trevor Paglin. And he's really interesting. Um, I'm going to read this little quick blurb yeah. about him. It says, Paglin's photographs show something we are not meant to see, whose concealment he regards as symptomatic of the historical moment we inhabit. Um, his objects act in opposition to what his images have exposed, imagining another potentially different world. He's a conceptual artist with activist intentions, helping to better see the particular moment we live in and producing spaces in which to envision alternative futures are among his chief concerns. So what he does is he really delves into things like government secrecy, surveillance, um, things that we're not supposed to pay attention to. And I love this stuff. If you tell me I'm not supposed to pay attention to something, that's what I'm going to look at. Um, yeah. I mean, it kind of goes back to the up value, down value thing we've been talking about for years. That if you go to like a sale, like taking it way back thrifting, if you go to an estate sale and they have something on a podium and say, buy this thing, you can almost guarantee that thing's going to be overpriced. Whereas if you go and dig in like the the bin, the boxes under the table, you dig in the filing cabinets, that's where you're going to find the real treasure. And I think this is kind of the thing of like looking um, for things you're not supposed to see. And he did some really cool things. So he has uh, photographs of kind of secret places. Yeah. And, you know, the, the quote you pointed out was about the door. Yes. So he says there's a lot of secrecy. And he says, I'm not focused on what's behind the secrecy, like what's behind it, but well, I want to door behind the door. I want to focus on the door and study the door. What yes. does the door tell us? Yes. Which mm. I thought was really cool. Well, I, I think one of the things that I love about that is that the door, like it, it's kind of like taps into being a hacker in yeah. some ways. Like you look at what you can see, first of all, like, okay, um, like, like, I don't know, if you're, if you're looking at like a code or a website mm -hmm. or something, you can tell certain things. You can tell what it was coded in. You can tell what techniques they're using. Um, like there's the sort of well, things. Yeah, to, to put, yeah, as a developer. <clears throat> yeah, um, put your spin on this. Right, right. People put up websites. I can look at the source code and immediately tell what they use to create that website. I mean, it's a click funnel site. I can tell it's a click funnel site. It's a WordPress site. I can tell it's a WordPress site. If you have WordPress with plugins, I can see what plugins you have installed just by looking at the source code. I can see what JavaScript framework you're using. And so there's a lot so I can see I can surface. Secret. It's not secret because sites are public and the code is public. Anyone can see the code. So it's kind of by studying what is right in front of you, like what you can see 
Like if you actually start looking at things in detail, you see things in all kinds of ways, like yeah. perspective. And this is something that I love about creative thinking. Like um, I think you can look at a tree and you can say it's a tree. And I get so frustrated <laughs> because sometimes I feel like Facebook nine times out of 10, if I post a picture and I say, what is this? People say, oh, it's a tree. I'm like, yeah, I know that. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's, let's dig into this a little more. Now, okay, let's take a tree. There's a million ways you can look at a tree. You can chop up a tree and look at the rings inside it. You can like pull down all the branches and turn it into firewood. You can like, I, I don't know, you can like say, what's a tree look like when it's black and white? How old is a tree? You can think about what a tree teaches us about history. You can look at the roots of the tree. Like this so You can many... look at the state of the tree and tell what season is it. Yes. Or like if it's been like, wh whether it's been destroyed or whether it's healthy, like looking at the tree tells you so many things. Um, and I think if you're sort of working on creativity, I think it's really, really powerful to just look at an object, like any object for a bit and see how many different ways you can look at it, like what kind of perspectives you can have on that and what it tells you. Um, and that's a way to generate like niches, to yeah, generate ideas. Really yeah. Like how many low content books can you make based off trees? <laughs> like seriously, think about it. Think about family trees. Um, think about, I don't know, soil quality. Think about um, the beauty of expanding into the sky and reaching upwards and growth. Like mm -hmm. just let your brain go with things like that's that's what we yeah. do a lot just kind of brainstorm on things i bet wiz khalifa does that <laughs> <laughs> i'm just saying <laughs> um anyway we're, we're, we're trees okay so um this was one of the exhibits that trevor paglin had at um at the show at the, the museum and what we're looking at are patches so these are fun they're military patches for projects and operations that the names were secret so these are like black ops <laughs> right. patches and they're so cool this one here let me see i think i've got a picture of it oh, where is it yeah, hold on it. no i had it there oh my gosh if i tell you i have, I have to, to kill, kill you, you. and oh it's just black is that like the creepiest patch ever and how cool would you be like the guy that has that patch? if you're that guy yeah and there's some others here like <laughs> special um what does that say something nobody nikor i don't know i can't read that I, I can't. oh no oh it's like a I don't NK -A know. no one knows anything i don't know right no um way. i'm guessing it's something a lifetime of silence behind the green, green door. door what creeped me out was all these like wizard hats i didn't understand <laughs> what that was about they these kept coming up a lot yeah. actually these kind of like spy characters mm -hmm. with the the hats and the um and the eyes but fun stuff the ghost squadron so these are all supposedly genuine patches that for military projects. And he had loads of cool stuff on Area 51 and other things. Another thing this made me think about is the importance of collections and curation. Um, I mean, like this, oh, if we go back to it, this is basically an art exhibit based on a collection he made of something unusual. Like he noticed something unusual, something interesting and turned it into something you could put in a museum. Now, he also has a book, I think, I think he has a book on the patches oh, okay. um, where he has where he talks more about these, which I think is so cool that you can create a book based on a collection. Yeah, like I, I kind of want people to think about this, like what kind of interesting objects can you collect and turn into a book? Mm. Now, another thing I wanted to mention briefly here um, is the idea of curation. Like he, he, he curated a lot of sort of pictures, a lot of maps. There was a lot of public domain stuff yes. at the exhibit where he'd found like um, pictures of the desert from like the 1800s or 1900s mm -hmm. and compared them to pictures now to show what's changed. Um, he used a lot of data that's publicly available, maps. Um, a lot of what he was talking about and studying was cables under oh, the yeah, sea. Oh, yeah, that was one of my favorite pictures. So he took a photo of a beach. Uh, I, I forgot where it was at. Um, and you look at it, okay, why is there a photo of a beach? But then next to it is a map, uh, I believe a military map, that shows all the international cables. And also how they can allegedly intercept yes, them. Yes, yes, and how like the NSA can, can tap into these cables. Allegedly. Right, and pull information. And so there's this like underground network of information being transferred on a massive scale. And these people are on the beach and are completely clueless 
that these cables are just 20 feet off the shore. So I think what's interesting there is that curation idea, of yeah. bringing these different things together and like intersecting one idea against another, the people at the beach versus like a map of cables. Like right. guys, think about this. When you're coming up with creative ideas for your books, for whatever it is you're doing, think about that juxtaposition. It's like a really good sort of art technique to get people thinking, like hold up this against that and see what it is. Um, and another thing I wanted to mention here that is something we touched on in Curate, I believe, in our Curate course, mm -hmm. um, which is the Freedom of Information Act. Yes. Now, the Freedom of Information Act, if you're creating books or you're creating content or you're creating digital works, um, in our Curate course, we talk quite a lot about using government information. Now, you can get a lot of information from the CIA, the FBI have a whole vault um, full of uh, like the crime stuff, mafia gangs uh, or mafia families, gangs. Um, there's a lot of public domain uh, content on the uh, CIA and the FBI's websites, which is like pretty fascinating. Like if you, one of, one of the classes in curators on true crime, um, and you can put together true crime books by really browsing around public domain information. There's a lot out there. There's even photographs, there's pictures, a lot you can pull together and publish in a book. Now, um, what's really interesting, though, is if you can't find stuff on a website, you can actually use the Freedom of Information Act to actually write to government departments to ask them about information you believe they have. So if you know there was some research taking place into a particular thing, unless it's classified, they will provide you with that information. That's pretty cool. And this is really good to know because many government agencies have a lot of research that isn't publicly available. Um, however, it's public domain. Like if you can get your hands on it um, and you, you know about it yeah. and you can ask them. So you can say, tell me, like, give me the information you have on this topic on from these dates or give me information you have on this research study you can get a lot of information from government agencies and you can totally use that in your books and he used that a lot a lot of the works that he used um the letters he shared and things like that were acquired through the freedom of information act um so that's actually a really really powerful tool like if if Producing government work, if, if um, reproducing government work or curating or collaging government work, and you can do it in all sorts of ways. You can do it artistically like Trevor Paglin did. You can do it for information and content. You can do it for historical interest. You can turn things, I mean, you can go and search the military websites, make a coloring book of fighter jets. Like there's all kinds of ways to use this. Um, you can, where, where are you going to go? Oh, I want a coloring book of the Mueller report. Oh my God, <laughs> the Mueller report. Yeah. Epic. <laughs> oh my gosh, that would be a best selling. You know it. I'm, I'm, I still wish I, I'd, I'd gone with the, the caps I did. The, someone, yeah, yeah. someone on our show the other week said um, it should be called the Mueller Report. Oh, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We, we were talking about how you could do the Mueller Report with caps to cover up the. the I don't know. I, I, there's so many bits. ways you can go about doing it, but just conceptually, I think it's. I, I mean, have fun with things. Try yeah. out ideas. Sometimes it's the weirdest ideas or the weirdest intersects that sell like it really is i mean when when sasha made the calm the f down coloring book she was the first person to do a, a sweary coloring book so <laughs> apparently it's like the swamp monsters in it i love it um so there you go you have swamp have swamp monsters the Mueller report was swamp monsters um yeah so i i think I, I don't know. I was very fascinated by Trevor Pagler. Another thing, and as we've overrun anyway, we can yeah. we can keep talking a bit. Um, so another thing he did that I, I thought was really cool um, was the last pictures. And actually, let me just see, because I have a picture that mm -hmm. I took of the last pictures. Um, so give me a moment. Um, the concept of the last pictures uh, was, oh, I'm almost there. Um, oh, there it is. This yeah. is cool. Okay, I want to share yeah, this cool. picture because it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, so I need to make sure I'm in the right window. Go to Chrome. Go to Chrome. Oh, hold on, I need to be in the right Chrome browser. Yeah. I have like so many browser windows open. You guys would be like, ah. Oh. Well, I'm like, ah, oh, I mm -hmm. don't know. You'd probably be like, oh, that's easy. Okay, here we go. Let's um, share that. So this was another project he did that I thought was so cool. Um, what you're looking at here 
he called it the last photograph or the last pictures. Um, and we have a thread about this in our KDP group at the moment. Uh, and what these pictures are, are 100 pictures he selected um, that he kind of felt represented humanity's story in a way. So the theory goes, he envisioned a future where the ruins of civilization, of human civilization, are not like the great pyramids or any human artifact on earth, um, but instead he felt that after the earth was gone, all the satellites in the sky will still be floating there dead and talking to no one. Okay. Isn't that creepy? That is. So, and, and actually it was kind of interesting. He's, he's really into um, satellites. Yeah. I wanted to share this with you because I found this out today. Okay. Um, he's actually got a project where he's planning to launch a satellite created purely as an artistic gesture that um, has light. It has bright light and it's called the orbital reflector. His satellite will reflect light and he says it will be as bright as a star in the Big Dipper. He hopes the work will rekindle our interest in near space, a region that he fears is being colonized by less benign military hardware. So he's like, okay, the space is full of military hardware. What if we put like, what if the people put things out there that are positive and sort of like we, we give something out there. So he's just a satellite that's going to be a bright light. <clears throat> yeah, I guess so. Whoa. But with that in mind, he also, and, and this is something he has done. Mm -hmm. He put all of these images on a golden disc. So there's a hundred images. He put them on a golden disc and they are in another satellite that's in space. And the idea is that like, after the earth is long gone, mm -hmm. the aliens are going to come along and find this satellite full of these cool pictures and they're going to understand humanity a little bit better. <laughs> now, what's cool about this is Carl Sagan actually started doing something like this in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And actually this picture here, of the guy eating, this is from a video that Carl Sagan made um, about to educate aliens on humans, <laughs> to teach <laughs> aliens what humans do. And I just, I mean, I, I love this for so many reasons, yeah. but I also want to go back to the idea of collections. Like think about making books of collections of cool stuff. Like why not, like why not curate? I mean, obviously you've got to make sure it's all public domain or you have copyright rights right, to it right. or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, but you can collect public domain stuff and create a book that had something like this. It would be pretty awesome. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you, maybe get your brain ticking. Like there's so many other cool things we saw there. Like he had lists of code names that people use that, that government agencies have used, scrolling lists of code names, um, just like so much interesting stuff, especially for conspiracy uh, freaks. So there we go. Uh, okay, someone's moving weird mm -hmm. things. Um, okay, so I think we are about done actually. We've gone over, we've well gone yeah. over drawn. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 yeah. Okay, so um, we're gonna go and have a barbecue. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Is that the plan? We're yeah. gonna go yeah. grill some steak. Mm -hmm. um, I hope you guys have an awesome week. It's been really fun talking to you. Um, we really like you sharing with us and yeah. um yeah come and join our facebook group if you're not in it yet it's uh at facebook.com slash groups slash amazon creates <laughs> wasn't so forward thinking uh, I, I, I know i know um but you know what people often still search for create space um so it's a uh, facebook.com slash groups slash amazon create space um and we would love for you to join us all right guys have a, a great week we love you bye, bye.